Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. It's nice to see everyone coming in the room. We appreciate it. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and get started in about 15 seconds or so. Welcome everyone. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Damian Leach and I'm the Youth and Community Engagement Project Manager at the Center for Community Health Improvement at Mass General Hospital. Um, so I will be moderating today's session. Uh, welcome to our Mass General Brigham Lunch and Learn series. In honor of mental health, uh, Minority Health Month, today's session is all about redefining access in BIPOC communities to heal from the impacts of COVID-19. Thank you to our community partners and to all of our viewers and the audience who have joined us today. Today you will hear a meaningful discussion about healing from the impacts of COVID-19 from We Got Us, the Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition, and Vital Connections. We will have each community partner introduce themselves First, we'll start with We Got Us. Hey everyone, um, it's so great to be in community with you. Um, my name is Lashira Nolan, but no, most folks know me as Lash and I'm the founder and executive director of We Got Us. Um, and we're an organization that was started um, in 2020 as a response to how folks were speaking about um, the vaccine and, and marginalized communities and not really making sure that we gave enough light to the access issues that a lot of our communities were having. So uh, we are a grassroots community mainly led by students and our main three pillars are empowerment through education to convey not convince and the third is to put public health first and recognizing that a lot of the inequities that existed prior to the pandemic are going to continue afterwards if we don't really think about policies and different public health interventions that we need to make. Um, so I'm joined here today with our amazing director of community engagement Kareem and I'll let him speak a bit more about um, his role in really building the community partnerships that we've been able to, to create this year. So my name is Kareem King. I am the Community Agent Director of We Got Us. Um, and essentially my job with this organization has been to plan in-person events to basically like interface with their communities. So finding ways to basically address resource and access when it came to things like masks and PPE early on in the pandemic. And also like thinking about helping people find vaccine appointments and like learning where like COVID-19 testing sites were in their individual communities. And since we kind of started in since last year, our organization has kind of evolved, like thinking about what are other holistic health practices that we can infuse into like our programs and thinking about other ways that we can basically like, be a resource to the community, trying to address those underlying systemic issues that have been existing since way before the pandemic started. Um, so really excited to be here with you guys today and talk a bit more about our organization and how we can work to heal from the pandemic. Excellent, thank you so much, Kareem and Lash. Next, we will introduce the Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition. Thank you, Damien. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Chevelle. I'm Mattapan resident first, um, and my passions include working with young people, the community, and a growing interest in transportation. Um, but I'm also the executive director of Mattapan Food and Fitness Coalition, or MFFC. And we've been in existence since 2006 and have been volunteered based for 13 years. And now we have a few staff, which I'm very excited about. Um, we are a health and wellness organization in the community of Mattapan, for those who don't know. And along with our residents, we identify the inequities um, with the core of our work being to engage our residents in exploring those inequities, collaborating, collaborating with them, um, students, community orgs, any types of partnerships, and to find solutions um, to be able to advocate for the changes um, that the community would like to see. Thank you, Chevelle. Next, we will introduce Vital Connections. Thanks, Damien. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Rich Joseph. Um, I guess first and foremost, a former trainee and physician currently at the Brigham. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with, uh, this is on this MGB uh, panel um, and started Vital Connections out of my work as a 
resident uh, and then as an attending afterwards and getting very involved in the communities of Roxbury and Dorchester specifically. Uh, and our work really centers on the idea that um, there are so many wonderful organizations, some of which you've just heard of here, and wonderful direct services and resources in the community. Oftentimes, however, they're they're working either in silos or they're uh, not connected in ways that can amplify their efforts, uh, nor are they often connected to larger institutions like MGB who could further resource them uh, and help amplify their efforts. And so Vital Connections really is meant to serve as primarily a linking function uh, amongst all the wonderful resources here in Boston, trying to create collective action, and collective impact, uh, rather than adding, you know, additional direct services in the community. Uh, so taking our cue from community and working with them to build efforts that we can then further resource uh, with, you know, help from the MGPs of the world. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of your introductions. Um, and personally, I just want to say it's also an honor to be here with all of you as well. Um, so next, we will review the purpose for today's session. Um, we are committed to supporting our community as we heal from the impacts of COVID-19. Although the virus may be down, we know the mental, physical, social, and economic impacts of the virus still exist to this day. Today, we will be discussing not only the outcomes we see in our BIPOC communities, while also highlighting the importance of increasing access to resources as part of the process of healing from the impacts of the pandemic. With regards to our objectives, today we will describe long-term outcomes impacting quality of life following COVID-19. We will also determine ways to incorporate healing practices and self-care and panelist work in daily life. And lastly, we will apply strategies for engagement to heal from the impacts of COVID-19 outside of the medical realm, like in policy and in community domains. So next up, we will ask our panelists some questions and open up for discussion. So the first question is, um, and feel free um, if anyone would like to jump in here, um, please provide an overview of your work and how you address the impacts of COVID-19 within BIPOC communities. Yes, so basically talking about We Got Us. So our job has mainly been to find ways to identify like what resources are available to people in the communities and then kind of bridge that gap when it comes to providing them with that information. So early on in the pandemic, that looked like basically um, getting together the resources that like existed on COVID-19 and making sure that that information was digestible and accessible to BIPOC communities, specifically the Black community. And what that looks like is us creating educational materials, basically give that out. So things like brochures, pamphlets, as well as um, as well as posters, and also like having a website that kind of collates a lot of those resources together for people in one place. So really, what we try to do is create like a one-stop shop for getting this information, especially like because early on we saw that a lot of the misinformation that was out there was coming from multiple directions. So some people getting information from the CDC, from the state level organizations, from local level, and also from like social media and their own individual networks. So finding ways to really like address that gap when it came to misinformation and people not knowing where to turn to for that information. And then we also um, engage with people through actual in-person events. So going door to door, so like basically canvas and provide those resources to people, going to vaccine clinics as volunteers and also as um, kind of peer community messengers having one-on-one -on -one conversations about COVID-19 and the vaccine, and also identifying like other ways that people might be um, experiencing um, disparities when it came to things like housing inequities, food and access, and really trying to bridge those gaps when it came to bringing together institutional partners to basically, like, make, basically to address those issues. Thank you so much, Kareem. Yep. And I, I must say that, um, you know, it's been such a, a wonderful experience to be out in the community with We Got Us, um, you know, and having our community messengers um, team along with you all um, to really make sure that the access, there's access to information so people can make the right decisions around their health. You know, there's been a big um, sort of miss, uh, a distribution of misinformation, um, particularly to communities of color. And it's caused a lot of hesitancy and for people to not feel comfortable um, trusting certain 
resources, including the, getting the COVID-19 vaccine. And it's just been so powerful to be out there with you all, um, really making sure that people know that it is safe um, and, um, and, and, and it is important to have that access to healthcare so that you can make good decisions around your health. I can go next. Um, so in my intro, I mentioned that MFFC identifies in inequities, and there have been lots of inequities um, in the Mattapan area um, prior to COVID, um, such as environmental inequities, environmental justice, because Mattapan is an environmental justice um, community. Um, food system inequities currently have 27 plus fast food restaurants, which the number just keeps on growing. I don't know why. Actually, we probably do know why. Um, um, you know, not forgetting about folks, foods, uh, folks who need food in general. So working with our Urban Farm and Institute or community gardeners um, to provide that local fresh food, um, limited opportunities for physical activity. Again, there's not a gem in the Mattapan area, but we do have this, these wonderful outdoor spaces um, that individuals can go and utilize. Um, and then lastly, some inequities of residents not feeling heard um, when it comes to what they want to see in their community. And COVID-19 has really reaffirmed that the work that we have been um, doing and the inequities that we have identified prior to COVID-19, like we should keep doing those. And so that's what we did. Um, we kept providing um, fresh fruits and vegetables and produce through our farmer's market um, and partnering with organizations such as the Mattapan Community Health Center um, in the city of Boston to give out information about COVID-19 because that is not our expertise. And so we're a collaborative organization. So partnering with organizations who know that it's much better and we st stuck to what it is that we are able to provide. Um, and then some, statistics, some stats um, about Mattapan is Mattapan is 70 to 87% Black, like those numbers, Gary, um, which includes folks who are um, African-American immigrants, as well as West, West Caribbean, Haitian, Barbados um, from Jamaica. And then also Mattapan has a high rate of, of youth 18 and under, as well as older adults. And don't quote me on these stats right here, but the last stat that I see was about 20% for each um, age group. Um, and because MFFC helps to support Mattapan residents in general, uh, we do work with all age gaps. That's awesome. You know, I, I think there's a huge need for, um, you know, intergenerational audiences to really come together to take on these issues together. There's so much that we can learn. Um, younger folks can learn from older people and older people that can learn from younger people in terms of how we address a lot of these inequities that we've seen before the pandemic, right? Like when we go to our neighborhoods, the things that we see, it's not like we lost touch with those things because they still impact us to this day. I can just chime in briefly and, and say, number one, I had the pleasure of meeting Chevelle way before the pandemic. So she's been doing this work for a long time and, and to the point that just, you know, these inequities have been persistent long before COVID and will be persistent long after COVID. One of the, you know, silver linings of COVID is that it really has sort of, you know, unveiled a lot of these inequities to an audience that may not have seen them or uh, recognized them before. Um, I'll just say a little bit about, you know, Vital Connections work during the pandemic, I think some of our work benefited from, I think, the collaborative nature that took place during the pandemic. I think a lot of organizations realized that they needed to work together, that, uh, you know, this this crisis was beyond sort of the, the ability of one organization to actually try to handle on its own. And, and you know, there's a real need for uh, collaboration and sharing of resources uh, to help address some of the acute needs that were exacerbated during the pandemic. And uh, I think one of the things that we saw and recognized pretty clearly, and a lot of our work comes out of it, was just that there were amazing groups of residents and people in the community who really wanted to step up and, and help the community and, and knew who needed the help, right? And, and had the trust of those people already. Uh, and I think a lot of our work is figuring out how to provide some of the operational support and capacity building for those folks to, to be able to do that work. Because uh, oftentimes there's inequities even in terms of uh, the ability for organizations to get resources and get funding and, and have project management support to actually execute uh, on delivering services in the community. And, um, and I think that's really where a lot of our work is centered. Uh, and it's been really amazing to see just the impact that, that people can have uh, and want to have if you provide them with the right 
capacity uh, and and supports. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. I, I, I just want to shout out just front y'all as frontline workers and frontline workers just in, in general, just that are, you know, out in the community, you know, not somewhere all the way over in like the other side of like town, like right in the middle of where it's all at, really making a difference, giving everything you can to just support the community that you're in. And um, also, you know, helping those communities to have the infrastructure. Um, you know, there's, there's strengths that come from the community. Um, you know, we're reflections of the community and to be able to, you know, just um, hold that hold that torch, you know, hold, hold that light up for everyone to make sure that we all good. Thank you so much for, for all the work that you've done. Um, next up, I want to move on to question number two. So the question is, what inequities do you feel have been exacerbated by the pandemic? So a little bit more specifically, how have these inequities impacted people's access to resources? Um, and who is at most at risk? And how can we close the disparity gap? I don't mind going first. Um, I won't talk about food. I'm going to talk about something different, um, but in general, those who were struggling or the brink of struggling um, were, were deeply impacted by the pandemic, and we all know that with the loss of employment, some individuals finding themselves juggling between paying a bill, paying for public transit, buying food, daycare, cell phone bill, and all that stuff. Um, but I just want to focus more on transportation um, because I feel like it's something that's not talked about in terms of the inequities there. And so transportation did become a major challenge during the pandemic. And those who were privileged to have a car were able to get around more safely than those who took public transit, which means taking the bus or the train. Um, and people took, took the bus or their train at a necessity. Um, because they did not have that car, using it to go to grocery stores, doctor's appointments, schools, work, whatever was happening during that time. And then those who are most at risk, again, are those who had to use that mode of transportation um, and wasn't able to get the resources in their community. They had to go out to get those resources. Um, and so, in fact, using those pub using public transportation um, declined significantly during the height of the pandemic. For example, the 28 bus that runs through the communities of color, which is Mattapan, Dorchester, and Roxbury, um, used to have about 1,200, um, 12, sorry, my, excuse me, 12,000 riders each day. And that number dropped to about 20, 26%. Um, and then you all know, if you don't know, the former mayor, Kim Janey, in 2021, um, she announced the free fare pilot for the 28 that started, started sometime in August. And then from the city of Boston's report of that, um, folks who ride the 28 bus has risen from around 47,000 weekly rides um, to about 70,000 weekly, 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 rides, weekly rides. Talking too fast. Um, and then if you all don't know, Mayor Wu extended the pilot um, to include the 23 and the 29 for two years. And the first goal of extending and making the buses free in communities of color to promote rider equity. Um, and so how can we close the close that disparity, disparity gap when it comes to transportation. Um, of course, it's support with monetary donations or with time to organizations that have been advocating um, for transit justice, um, such as ACE, Alternatives for Community and Environment, the Fairmont Indigo Transit Coalition and MFFC. And these organizations that I named are run by BIPOC, BIPOC individuals and individuals that actually live in the community. Um, that I'm aware of, right? Um, and they've been doing this work and have information about what the residents want um, because they're residents themselves. Um, and then the last thing, you know, how can we close that is we all need to start going to these community meetings because again, the residents already know what they want. They already know what the solution is. Um, so we just need to go in there if you're not already in, in there to get a better um, and deeper understanding of what the community is saying. Thank you so much, Abel. And I just want to add that, um, you know, as a as a Roxbury uh, native, someone who's who fr who's from, you know, what used to be known as Dudley, now Nubian Square, um, you know, it's uh, transportation is definitely a huge thing for us, you know, um, and I, I have vivid memories of people from ACE coming up, knocking on my door, talking to me about what's going on in terms of um, making, you know, the environment um, more, you know, healthier. 
um, especially for, for the residents, you know, people who have asthma and things like that. So I love that um, there's people out there on the ground really engaging with the community. And, um, you know, these people are the experts of the needs that are in the environment. And so it's incredible for us to be able to um, highlight other organizations that are also out there as well doing this incredible work. chime in next. Um, Chevelle, thank you so much for bringing up transportation because in the context of health, I think that it's something that we don't often think about. Like, how are you going to physically get to your appointment and like how safe is it for you to be able to do that? And whenever we, we got us talk about the pandemic in the context of health outcomes, we always think of it as this great exacerbator because everything that existed before that was inequitable was pretty much worsened by conditions of the pandemic. So I remember when at first um, the public health measures were coming out about social distancing and washing hands. And um, there was this inherent assumption that everybody had access to clean water or everyone had access to water to wash their hands or the privilege to social distance when you live in a home with grandma and you live in an intergenerational household because of how expensive housing is in our communities um, and how a lot of folks are being pushed out uh, by gentrification with displacement. So I think that when whenever we talk about the pandemic, we just have to acknowledge the fact that a lot of the different policy gaps that we had previously, whether it's around people being protected at work and having paid leave and um, paid childcare and access to housing and all of those things, um, they were just worsened by the conditions of this virus. And you can see that along the lines of the disparities by, by, by race and ethnicity um, that we saw. And unfortunately, that's because of the remnants of systemic racism that continue to persist um, from a policy perspective and how that impacts health. Yes, thank you, Ash and Chabelle, for, for making for those words. And I just wanted to add on that thinking about like housing inequities, um, before the pandemic started, 40% Actually, it was 40%, 20% of population was Black and Latinx for unhoused people. So when we talk about like housing inequities and thinking about the pandemic itself, this already existed before the pandemic started. And then we saw that once that actually started to happen, people had to do things like social distance and to isolate when they got sick from COVID-19. We started to see people who couldn't actually physically do that. Um, Black and Latinx people were being evicted from housing because of things like not being able to go to work and being able to actually make bills on time, having to think about other things that they have to pay for as opposed to getting things like PPE and other protections for themselves and their families. So all these like underlying systemic issues that kind of were exacerbated by the pandemic and also thinking about other circumstances that people had to provide for in these situations. Um, and one thing I also wanted to mention is that when you think about housing inequities and the ability to like actually quarantine in these situations, people who don't have access to housing have to still quarantine when they're in places like shelters and things like that. But that's next to impossible when you think about the actual like space that they have in those shelters. Being able to actually like um, get better from illness and not affect other people is like something that's nearly impossible in those situations. So these are just like some of the things we have to think about when we talk about the pandemic and like how people are actually adversely affected by it. Thank you both um, Lash and uh, Karim for, for sharing that. Um, you know, it's it's interesting how housing inequity is so close to home. You know, um, I remember when the my General Brigham Community Care van was out in Nubian Square for the um, 29th annual Roxbury holiday parade and celebration where we were out there. Um, housing kept coming up and people talking to us about things that they're going through and that was around the holidays. You know what I mean? It's paired to springtime. It's like this, for many people, this hasn't been an issue that just goes away. It's like all year round, this is definitely a, a, a huge problem. Dr. Joseph, I definitely would love to hear your perspective as well in terms of um, what, it, what inequities you feel have been exacerbated by the pandemic um, and how have these inequities impacted people's access to resources and who's at most at risk and how can we close the disparity gap? Big question, Damien. Uh, I guess I would say, I would just echo everything that has been said. Uh, I, I don't you know, feel like I have as much to add around what's been exacerbated. I think that that's been 
pretty clear, especially you know, you know, for the folks who are on this this call. I think that that's been apparent. I think that the more challenging thing is actually like solutions, right, to those things and figuring out how to address those in a way that is not top down and that really is driven by community and that where there is like an actual transfer of power and agency uh, to make change. And and I think that that's that's more of the the challenge, I think it's not hard to identify needs. Uh, I think it's a lot harder to identify solutions and make those things sustainable. Um, and so I think, you know, to Chevelle's point, like, I think the place to start is by going to community meetings, right? And, and like, just listening and hearing. And I think, you know, even for me, as someone who spent a lot of my time in like the, the hospital world for a long time, and sort of in the ivory tower, just like, it's just, you can't, you need to figure out ways to put yourself in the place of other individuals, right? And really understand uh, and build empathy in terms of what people are going through. Um, and I don't think there's any substitute for, for doing that in order to like actually figure out how to make a difference on these issues. Um, but then I think it's about how do you work with large existing institutions and structures of power uh, in and you know, sort of being realistic about the way that power works in in the world right now, and thinking about how to actually transfer that, um, you know, in a way that in a way that is sustainable, uh, and that, yeah, le I mean, leverages the power of institutions like MGB, right? Like that's why we're here uh, as to talk about this. So, um, I think it's important to to have real discussions about it because the needs are the needs are pretty clear. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one thing, you know, the infrastructure, right, like um, having the infrastructure within communities, not something that is put onto the community by someone else. It's like, you know, the, the community members are the experts of what goes on in the community, how uh, that, you know, the health of the community. Um, and so I want to talk about community assets here for this next question. Um, so, what are some examples of community assets that have successfully helped people to heal from the impacts of COVID-19? I'll go ahead and open up. Yes, so I can share a bit about that first when we got us perspective. So I think one of the biggest things that have kind of helped people heal from the pandemic, um, especially kind of just the immediate need when it came to inequities with the vaccination were mobile vaccine clinics and community spaces. So essentially when we got us got started, one of the big things that we wanted to do is find ways to address the inequitable vaccine rollout. So with that, we partnered with organizations like um, Get Out the Vaccine, who basically like um, were able to, able to vaccinate over 10,000 people in underserved communities throughout Boston. So thinking about um, Dorchester, Mattapan, as well as the Roxbury community. So finding ways to like really partner with people who are doing things like mobile vaccine clinics to really bring these direct services to people in these communities who don't usually like know where to go or have that same direct access to people who might be closer in proximity to hospitals or mass vaccination sites. Um, and I think other ways that we've kind of seen like people provide resources in this way is thinking about food access. Um, so Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition, they partnered with the Greater Boston Food Bank to provide people with like food boxes at like a lot of their events. So basically providing that direct service to people. And then we've also seen other resources be provided when it came to like housing inequities, which was largely a big part of, um, which, which is largely um, produced in part by advocacy on behalf of organizations like Massachusetts Union of the Homeless, as well as um, Housing Equals Health and Massachusetts Coalition Health Equity. So thinking about like ways that we kind of see these resources be um, provided during the pandemic, one thing I also want to say is that we've seen a lot of money be infused into kind of addressing this really big issue, but that I feel like that's, that same thing should continue to happen even after the pandemic um, basically like closes out. We probably won't see it like kind of go back to what it usually was because like it'll become endemic at some point, but I think the major problem here is that we're infusing a lot of resources to address this problem when the problem already existed, but it's been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So finding ways to really make sure that the access and the resource that we're providing to people is sustainable, even after like the, the emergency, like um, diseases. I can go. Um, when I introduced myself, I said I was a Mattapan resident first before I introduced myself as a title where I work. Um, and so I would say one of the community assets is the community itself. Um, during COVID-19, I heard stories of neighborhood associations coming through for each other and checking on elders and other individuals who weren't able to get outside. 
um, another thing that was happening is social isolation. Those who don't have someone to talk to um, when they were at the pan uh, during the pandemic and they couldn't go outside and things like that. Um, so the community helping each other during that time. Um, some other examples is a neighborhood association building a food forest. Um, they came together, they thought about what it is that they wanted to do and out came an idea of building a food forest. And that food forest is going to be debuted um, on, um, on May 7th. Um, and that was all a community-led idea. And then lastly, creating care kits for seniors. So just taking the time to just think about each other um, and, and seeing what it is that they can do to support each other. That's awesome. So <clears throat> um, with regards to the next question, um, what additional work is needed to address the impacts of COVID-19 within BIPOC communities and what challenges do you foresee in improving health of the community going forward? I'll just say that I think there's like a bit of a risk of looking at a lot of this through the lens of COVID-19. Uh, I think that you know, to the points that have been made before, uh, I think people view this as a bit like of like an, an episodic occurrence, um, rather than thinking about all that existed before and all that will happen after. And I think that you already see that with a bunch of the money that's been infused into COVID relief right now, sort of, you know, a lot of that, those resources are now being removed or taken away or depleted and, 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 um, uh, and I think so I think there's a risk of sort of viewing it as like a pandemic specific these are just like pandemic specific issues because then I think a lot of the the resources and energy that flows from that is feels like it's like limited right and like it's like we can fix this as long as like once COVID is done uh and so so I think that that's challenging because there's like a ton of I mean do a lot of work right now around a bunch of trauma and violence and you know work closely with Kareem and Lash with a few folks who you know are really plugged in in that you know thinking about the impacts of trauma and violence in the community and um you know again like those issues are going to be there going forward um and so uh, i just wanted to to call out that i you know appreciate like the response from you know government all the way to city and larger organizations to think about COVID relief but i think that there is a a bit of a challenge or a risk of viewing it exclusively through that lens um as, as sort of headline shift and national dialogue changes. Yeah, to build off of what, what's already been said and, and to Rich's point, I think just in general as a society, we tend to be more reactive than proactive. And I think that was definitely the case with the pandemic where we realize, oh, wow, these communities are disproportionately being impacted by this disease. But in reality, what we should have done is created a more robust public health infrastructure and start to proactively address some of those remnants of systemic racism with the policies that were in place to make sure that we were protecting people or making sure that like Mattapan had access to that gym and the resources that community members have been advocating for for many years, I'm sure. Um, so I think one, one thing that I'm afraid of is just in general being in Boston, like I, I just came here for medical school, but there's like a lot of money that is concentrated in the institutions that are associated with academia in Boston. So um, you think about Harvard Medical School where I'm a student, um, we are incentivized to come up with these cool ideas and go into the community and, and, and do these projects, but there isn't a lot of emphasis on sustainability. So what has happened during COVID-19 is that perhaps a lot of great community relationships have been forged and created, but how are we gonna make sure that those relationships are sustainable and that we're not saying that, hey, we care about you during the pandemic, but we really don't care about the fact that you don't have access to food or the fact that you are being pushed out of your homes actively right now. And how do we make sure that 
if we are really trying to build good relationships with our community members, that we're not leaving them out to dry after um, our project has been completed and we've written that paper and gotten that notoriety for being a community advocate. So I think that that's really important for us to think about um, as, as we kind of reflect on what happens moving forward to continue to support and empower our communities. Yeah, I think trust is, is a huge part of all this work and, um, you know, in, you know, engaging with folks in the community. It's like, these are people, these aren't like numbers. These aren't like statistics like that are in your face looking at. These are real people with real lives going through some real stuff. You know what I mean? And food, housing, I mean, all transportation, all these things are real issues that people go through. And it's, it's so important to really lead, um, are in our work knowing that these are people you know real lives that um you know we see every single day you know and many of us can can relate to the things that are that they're going through it's just so we a lot of us are connected to you know organizations and institutions already but um really inviting people to um build relationships and also being proactive and building those relationships yourself um in the community i've found has been really helpful in addressing a lot of these systemic issues because it seems like the system set up for us to be isolated and to not talk to one another and stay in silos and it's like that's not the that's that's not the solution that's contributing that's the problem you know so i agree with y'all cool um so <clears throat> next question um in terms of strengthening access, how can various individuals strengthen access to resources in the BIPOC communities? So such as like researchers, public health professionals, government policymakers, how can we strengthen access to resources in the community? I would say one of the, one of the most effective ways I've found to do that is by holding space for communities to express their needs. Um, Chevelle mentioned this like uh, earlier on the call, but community members know what their needs are and they've been advocating them for them for years. So really reaching out to those community members and seeing like what their thoughts are on like what the actual needs are and then providing the institutional supports to actually support those needs. So the first thing is holding space and the second thing is actually acting on what comes from that conversation. So when thinking about the lunch and learn that we're having today, we're kind of expressing the things that we've seen go on with the pandemic and what we can do to actually um, to continue the relationships that we've formed and really to um, transform what we think about healthcare and like providing equity for people in the medical system. But we have to actually make sure that there's action behind those words. So what are we doing as um, individuals and as advocates and as like public health professionals and government policymakers to make sure that the things that come from these conversations are actually implemented in the communities that we're serving? And how are we making sure that the community is like a major part or a key stakeholder in making sure that those resources become a part of the community? I will say that um, the first thing I'll say is we, we have to know who you are, right? So the community cannot know what it is that they can receive or what it is that you can do if they have never seen you before. Um, and so, you know, one way to do this is start building trusting relationships, like Kareem said, like holding space for individuals to share what it is that they're going through. Um, but not only doing it one time though, right? So like, don't come into the community one time, do what you need to do and say, hey, I got all my answers. And then we never see your face again. Because again, you're here, you're saying who you are, but we don't know who you are still. And I'm saying we as, as if I'm a part of the community again and not um, as, as my job. So who, who are you? Once we know who you, what you can provide, then we can tell you, hey, this is the, this, these are the things that we need in order to strengthen our community. Um, and then again, referring to what Lash said, like just making sure that we're also given the resources to continue on whatever it is that you find out um, from us. Because again, you could come and do your research, you give us something, you present it again, like what you found, and then what are we, the community, supposed to do with that? Um, again, referring to my job, if 
you know, if you're coming to MFFC, you're asking us to support you with something, how can we support you if we don't have the resources, right? All that money is somewhere else that I don't have access to, um, but you all have access to that. Um, so how can we work together to strengthen um, those, those resources for the community? I'll jump in here. Uh, many thoughts about this. I think that, um, you know, during the beginning of the pandemic, uh, especially when vaccinations were being developed and things like that, you, you saw a lot of physicians and sort of healthcare professionals spending time sort of doing webinars like this or like getting out into the community to talk about sort of what was happening uh, in terms of vaccine development and, and combating issues around hesitancy and stuff like that. And that was all well meaning, but I think that like, if you're talking about like the issues that we're talking about now in terms of like exacerbated drivers of health for people, right? Uh, like the community is the expert on those things. Like they are the experts, right? So they they should be invited as experts to talk to people in the hospital, like frontline clinicians, people who, you know, need to address those issues, but often don't have the right information or vantage point or perspective to do so. Um, and so I think that involves the transfer of power, really recognize the community as expert on those issues, right? And how do we engage them as experts and really hear from them about what is needed? And and um, and then, you know, to Chevelle's point, once you're able to sort of do that and really establish a transfer of power and really recognize the community as expert, then it's about the resources, right? And so what I'd like to see is, you know, I think those of us on this call and this webinar know that like there are an awesome group of people within MGB who all are really aligned around these issues and care a lot about health equity. But, you know, it's a matter of like bringing a bunch of other different stakeholders to those meetings, including the people who run the organization, including donors to the organization uh, and really getting them front and center in front of different community organizations. Um, and that that's when I think real change could happen. Uh, if, if, you, if you have people who are actually controlling the budget as well as you know real donors to mgb who then have to you know um you know think about could they could they give to community-based organizations right is that part of you know what their role should be um that's when i think we, we make some real substantial change um at least a good step towards it yeah i saw um uh, someone in the chat um Ingrid, uh, she had asked about a uh, partnership and it was about uh, this work that I enjoy so much is just like the relationship building and, you know, the friendships and, um, you know, for, um, I'm really curious and I'd, I'd like to ask her question, you know, what can Mass General Brigham do to show up as a community partner and how can we make a difference? And um, Rich, I think a lot of the things that you mentioned before around, um, you know, budgeting and donors and um, I think, you know, another thing is like making sure that the organizational strategy reflects the community and, and is humble in that approach to, as you mentioned, you know, respect community members as the experts of um, what they're going through in the community and what those needs are um, and to make sure that, you know, there's that, that space um, where, where when, you know, MGB and, and, and clinicians and, you know, policymakers, they, they come to these communities, they, they're like, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and take a seat and listen because this is what needs to be addressed, you know? Yeah, and I think that that might come with, uh, with the challenge of maybe, maybe not doing certain things, right? Not feeling like you have to, you know, have a certain program or do something that like has, you know, gets attention in the community or that gets headlines because of what you're doing. It may be more of like a silent donor approach, right? Where you're, mm -hmm. you're really using uh, the resources that you have to really empower community members and not needing to take any credit for that, quite honestly, or not needing to justify it in your budget. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just a different way of thinking. Um, and so I think that I would, I would pose that as a challenge. I, I do have an example to share of what not to do. Um, as a really small staff organization here in Mattapan that's doing a lot of work, um, a lot of my time is limited. And so I did have a partner come to me asking for a letter of support for building something in Mattapan. Never had any interaction with this person before. And it was the day before this person had to submit a grant or whatever sub application. And 
we said, we cannot write this letter of support for you, but we would love to connect with you um, to talk more because I never seen you before. I never talked to you before. The first interaction is us, as you asking me for something. Um, and then this person or organization never communicated with us again um, until they were building something. And then they started talking to us again, but there was no relationship building in between, right? And that was like a three, four year gap. And you coming, you're coming again with another ask. Um, so that's an example of what not to do. Um, and if you wanna be a committed partner, um, as Rich was saying, as Damien was saying, maybe you know you can be you can be silent. Like you don't have to get credit for all the things that you do, um, because we're gonna you know as a community based organizations, we're gonna we're gonna be receptive of what it is that you have to offer. Um, so yeah, so I hope that example was 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 a, was illustrated effectively of what not to do. I definitely want to keep going with this. Like, I, I feel like the conversation has become very fluid at this point, which is exciting. I love the spontane spontaneous uh, nature of, of this because this is what happens and this is how it really gets when 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 out in the community. So I, I want to ask, like, how can, you know, like, what are some upcoming events or ways um, for, like, say, for example, like MGB employees um, to connect with each of you and um, the work that you're doing? I know I'm yes. taking the time to um, <laughs> go again. I'm sorry, Kareem. I would say come out to our farmer's market. That is the best way to get to know our organization. It's to come on out during COVID. We continue doing the farmer's market because that was a place where people were social, was a place where people went to go to socialize. Um, and we always need help with setup, break it down, translation, dock and table at the farmer's market as well. Um, so come out, it starts July 9th. I could definitely send some more information to Damien um, once we get a flyer um, out. But yes, the farmer's market, perfect place. Yes, and I will say from the week at SN, we're always out in the community trying to provide services around like health information and increasing like um, knowledge about like certain different topics. So for one thing, we volunteer like weekly vaccine clinics, both in the Dorchester area and in Mattapan. So always looking for volunteers to help with those, especially trained medical professionals who can really like talk about like more complex topics for people, kind of provide that extra community resource. We also do outreach with the homeless population to provide them with things like um, masks, sanitizer, um, sunscreen, and basically like other like needed resources that they that they kind of deal with um, on a daily basis. So having people that can kind of like be there to kind of talk to them about any health issues they're going through. A lot of the times when we interface with community members, they're facing things like mental health issues or not having access to like a stable primary care physician, not knowing who to go to, to like basically ask their questions when it comes to their health and like basically like providing for those things. So that's always a, diff a different resource that we're looking for. And um, also translations. So we work with multilingual and multicultural populations. Um, so we basically always need help with like kind of translating for people, talk, having medical providers who like speak multiple languages. Um, all of our resources right now are, are basically translated into English, Spanish, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, and Chinese. So finding ways to expand those resources, we're currently looking to like expand into things like Somali um, and like one other um, African language that we kind of heard about in the community. Um, and basically just like, yeah, partnering on things like that. So like really trying to increase volunteer base, um, resource when it comes to translation, and also just coming out to events that we that we host in the community to provide that extra resource as medical professionals. I say that for, for Vital Connections, a lot of Vital Connections exists within the MGB world since I exist within the MGB world. And so a lot of what obviously I'm trying to do is sort of be a bridge between sort of the clinical community worlds, right? Like I think that that's super important. And I know tons of people within the institution who really you know, are very invested in and eager to get involved in community engagement work and health equity work. And, and I think one of the big challenges is right now there aren't, uh, you know, there's no mechanisms or sort of clear pathways within large academic centers to figure out how to do that, right? There's not as much of a professional incentive for people. Um, and I think one of the big objectives on my end, and part of the reasons that I'm, you know, still on faculty is that like I want to figure out how to create the infrastructure uh, to actually get students and trainees and faculty involved in local community efforts. And, and, um, and so, always welcome to chat with any folks at MGB about that. I mean, I'm, 
I'm in the system and feel free to email me. And then we also, a lot of the work that we do is about how do we bring organizations and people together sort of in community to just actually, you know, provide a collective space for people to talk and share resources and exchange uh, ideas. And so people are always welcome to join those meetings as well to just meet uh, and introduce themselves to a lot of different community groups uh, that we work with. That's awesome. I um I definitely want to make sure to circle back with all of you. If there's any information that I can share with our audience after this panel, um, I'm more than happy to. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, already I can see in the chat that folks want to like volunteer for different things. Um, it's, it's so important for us to, to to connect and work together on these efforts. And um, I'm really excited for. For, for all of these uh, connections and um, for all the exciting work that we can do in the future, you know what I mean? Um, like Chevelle at, at Mattapan uh, Food and Fitness Coalition, like I would love to come check out the farmer's markets and, um, you know, be part of that. And um, same thing with We Got Us and the empowerment sessions, you know what I mean? Like I definitely want um, for myself and, and for more people to, to know about um, these kinds of opportunities, just because a lot of us honestly, like, it is so much isolation and it's like when you can just connect with someone else and, and, and say hey like you know like we're working together on something that impacts our community it just there's there's a certain love that comes with that drive and um i really really appreciate you all for um inviting the community to be to participate in these kinds of uh opportunities so <clears throat> um with that, I want to um, invite uh, if anyone else in the chat has any questions or anything like that that they would like to ask, feel free to um, uh, type in your question in the chat there. And thank you for everyone that's already <laughs> typed stuff up. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, this has been such a beautiful conversation. And I'm really curious, like, has anyone seen We Got Us or uh, vital connections or Mattapan Food and Fitness um, Coalition out in communities, um, maybe on social media, um, just anywhere. Feel free to um, let us know in the chat. And um, before we wrap up, I just want to again um, give a big thank you to all of our panelists today uh, for sharing your incredible perspective. Perspectives, um, you know, you have a and, you know, uh, moderate this panel with all of you. Um, I feel like every time that I connect with y'all, I'm, I'm always learning stuff. And even during this session, I'm over here taking notes just because there's so many, so many different um, gems that uh, you all share just, just on a daily basis. So, so thank you so much, not only for being on the panel, but also um, for your friendship as well. Um, and you know, I definitely want to make sure to share with the audience um, any materials or any flyers. Um, so again, um, I'll make sure to send that out. Um, we just wanted to also um, uh, state a uh, upcoming event. Um, if anyone hasn't heard um, or is, is is now learning about it, um, we have the Mother's Day Walk for Peace coming up. Um, it's a really exciting event that's happening on Sunday, May 8th. Um, we're really excited to join with the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute's 26th Annual Mother's Day Walk for Peace on Mother's Day, Sunday, May 8th. In, spirit, in, in the spirit of healthy competition, we have two teams, um, Mass General Hospital and Brigham, squaring off to fundraise. Um, we're including a link in the chat as well um, for information on how to get involved with this important event. Um, really, we're walking alongside survivors, um, moms and families that have been impacted by homicide. You know, one of the things that came up for me during the session is like a lot of the inequities that existed like before COVID-19 and there's such, there has been such a huge youth violence epidemic um, that has impacted us even before COVID-19, which still exists and costs us lives to this day, you know? Um, and again, how do we act upon as a solution instead of doing what we're, what a lot of us have been taught or is the system set up for us to act and be reactive as Lash had mentioned earlier, you know? Um, so this is a great opportunity for us to come together and, and really take a stand together. Um, and, and, and in support of families that have been impacted by um, homicide and gun violence. 
I'd also like to announce the next Lunch and Learn is Friday, April 15th. That's this Friday. Um, it's part two of our series as we continue to look at redefining access in BIPOC communities to heal from the impacts of COVID-19. And um, last but not least, if there's anything that anyone else would like to share before we close out, um, I just wanted to open it up again uh, to our panelists um, before we wrap up. I'll just thank you, Damien, for and the rest of the team, uh, Renee Jai, I know behind the scenes and some others who have helped coordinate this. I think um, just having these conversations uh, and being able to spotlight um, some of us who are doing this work and, and continuing the effort to spotlight even more folks that ideally, you know, from the community um, who are also doing amazing work in, in their response to COVID and all the other issues uh, that we're talking about today. I think it's just it's a great thing to do uh, and finding more ways to get you know mgb employees and folks to engage in these conversations and come learn uh, and hear about what's happening sort of in their own backyard i think is a powerful thing i think that's where a lot of, of the change starts so thank you Awesome. Well, um, on behalf of the Mass General Brigham Community Engagement Team, um, thank you all for joining us today. And um, as I mentioned, if there's any questions or any follow up, feel free to reach out um, and I'll make sure to share out uh, the materials. Let's just keep building power, y'all. Um, much respect, much love. Looking forward to connecting with you all again soon. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Damien. Thank you.